The Sunday Baroque podcast is made possible by WSHU and the Friends of Sunday Baroque. You can find out more about the Friends of Sunday Baroque and find out how to become one yourself by visiting our website, sundaybaroque.org, under the Contact tab. Kyle P. Walker has a very busy career as a soloist and chamber musician in a variety of settings. He's also a founding member of The Dream Unfinished, an activist orchestra and collective which supports New York City-based civil rights and community organizations through concerts and presentations. He has crafted a performing career based on his optimistic belief that music can speak to social issues better than verbal language can. Kyle P. Walker joins me via Zoom to talk about some of his innovative collaborations and initiatives. It is so great to speak with you. It's great to speak with you. Thank you so much for having me. So let's just start with uh, how are you doing in these very strange times? You know, it's not easy to be anybody during a pandemic, but it's really especially not easy to be a musician during a pandemic. Are, Are you doing okay? That's right. I mean, I'm doing the best I can do. I I think for me and my family, we've been very fortunate. Um, And so I have to say for me, I'm doing fairly well um, personally. I would say as a country and a society, we're definitely not at our best right now. Um, But I think that this is more inspiration to create good art, you know, over the next year, because everybody was saying, oh, 2020 was such a horrible year. And here we are, I think it's the second or third week into the year of 2021. And already this year has not necessarily shown that it's going to be too much better. But obviously, we still have a lot of year to cover to make that better. Mm-hmm. So um, so right now, I'm focusing on some projects coming up this year that are hopefully going to sort of help dig at least me out of this 2020 pandemic uh, hideaway that I sort of got into. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, which is, which is good for me because I think it's, it's been sort of nice to have a break, um, from the craziness of life in regards to traveling and, mm-hmm. you know, learning things sort of quickly all the time. So, uh, right now I'm doing pretty well. Good, good. It's so interesting to hear you talking about, you know, backing off because you just have so many interesting projects going on. Um, It's actually hard for me to know where to start to to ask you some questions. But what I really want to do is to go back to your personal introduction to music. Do you come from a musical family? You know, was was piano your first instrument? You just were telling me before we started uh, recording that you have a a, a five and a half year old student that you started at three. So, you know, was that you one day at one point? And, you know, and Mm -hmm. when and how did you know that music is meant to be your life's work? Well, this is a wonderful question. I guess, did I come from a musical family? In my eyes, I came from a lot of musical inspiration, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But I now, having grown up and being married to another professional musician as well, and now we have a child that we had earlier in 2020 during the pandemic. um, I would say if I compare my upbringing to how we are raising our daughter so far in her short seven months of life, Um, I did not come from a musical family in the sense that I didn't have parents that were constantly teaching lessons online and and performing, I guess, online predominantly right now. But um, there was certainly not music constantly happening in my house growing up. With that being said, my mother sung quite a bit to both my sister and I from the age of birth. And, um, And I think that did have a big influence in me, especially... Um, when I think about the way that music is simply another form of communication, um, I think that for me, music has always been um, nothing more than a language. And um, the technical side of music has always been a little bit more, um, I guess I would say a struggle, something that I had to really learn um, as I got probably into high school. When I was in high school, I started school at um, a place where it was sort of a pre-college division of a conservatory. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I was exposed to lots of people much, much better than me um, that were older, they were in college, they were graduate students. And um, having that experience taught me, you know, that music is a very sort of intricate thing. I mean, that there are so many details that can that can continuously be worked out um, and, and revised and things like that. And I find now, years after uh, my first kind of serious exposure to classical music in high school, sometimes I go back to those pieces that I first learned in high school. And, um, and I'm still growing. And, and it, like you mentioned, I'm now uh, teaching heavily as well. So many of those pieces I now pass on to my students and I try to be the influence that my teacher was for me at that age, um, because so many of my favorite works and so many of my favorite composers came from my teenage years when I was first exposed to, to music of that caliber. Hmm. What are some of those pieces? Oh, they are probably the most uh, sort of traditional classical works for the piano, things like Chopin ballades. Um, things like Chopin Etudes, things like the the Well Timbered Clavier of Bach. Um, one of the things that my wonderful teacher in high school, Clifton Matthews, did with all of us in his studio was every year, sometimes multiple times a year, depending on the project, um, he would assign each of us a piece out of a large work. So one of the years was Schubert Sonata. So each one of us in the studio learned a Schubert Sonata. Um, which is not a small undertaking. Mm. It really takes a long time to um, to get into a Schubert Sonata. On its surface, sometimes they seem fairly simple, especially when you listen to them. But when you really are working on them and, and working to play them in a very expressive and um, convincing way, it really is, is quite tricky. So he worked with each of us on a Schubert Sonata, and then we put on a series of concerts of all the Schubert Sonatas. And the next year, we did the Well-Tempered Clavier of J.S. Bach. And the year after that, we did Debussy Preludes. And I think the semester after that, we did um, a piece by Isaac Albanese called uh, Iberia. And, you know, each one of these projects, ex uh, it, it exposed me not to the piece that I was just working on, but... Um, every week we had studio class where I was exposed to all of the other Schubert sonatas and all of the other prelude and fugues. And so, you know, these pieces um, are very near and dear to me all the time. And I'm constantly revisiting them and learning more about them and realizing um, sometimes, you know, when I am in a rut, like sort of like 2020, where performances, for the most part, come to a screeching halt and things and I can have a little extra time to revisit some of those older pieces and, and remember, oh, wow, I've actually grown quite a bit since I was, you know, 15, 16 years old and first learning, um, you know, some of these pieces. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. And what a positive and productive use of this time. Again, you know, not having the pressure of the deadline and the performance kind of held over your head. It's, it's good to be able to, to go and revisit those things. Absolutely. And it's Absolutely. a way to, it's kind of a, a, a way to touch base with, the genius of music, you know, the, mu the music that does have the capacity to grow in that way and also your talent to be able to grow with the music in that way. What a lovely, uh, what a lovely way to progress. Yeah, and I guess to add on to that, now that I have my own child, you know, to be able to pass on these things, of course, she's so young, she's probably not really aware of what she's actually hearing. But... Um, you know, for me, it's kind of a nice feeling to feel like, oh, I'm passing these these mm -hmm. gifts that were given to me on to my child. And hopefully by the time that she's of the age that I first learned these pieces, she'll already have um, this this nostalgia to, to these works as well. Yeah, yeah. So you're a founding member of The Dream Unfinished. Would you please talk yeah. about this? This is a social justice component of your musical life. And I know that, for example, uh, you recently had a season that focused on climate change. And I think, you know, people don't necessarily think of music and classical music, especially in climate change. But you were featuring composers from communities that were historically impacted by climate change. Could you talk a little bit about that? Like what composers, what communities, and how did this all synthesize? So the Dream Unfinished started in 2015. 
um, in the aftermath of the protests that were happening um, in regards, to, particularly in this case, to the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of a call to action, not only um, to everybody, to young people particularly, but I think to classical musicians, because classical musicians tend to take the stance of neutrality in terms of political issues. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the pop music and any any sort of more mainstream entertainment um, sort of music, I think people are much more outspoken about their oh. their views on society. When you think of people like Kanye West and Beyonce and Jay-Z and all of these people that um, really speak their minds when it comes to issues that impact us all like this. And so I felt that this is our mission as classical musicians to um, to speak up when there is unjust happening in society. And yeah, one of those years, actually two years ago, we focused on climate change. Uh, and in particular in New York City, there are some communities which um, hadn't really been cleaned up properly from mm -hmm. Hurricane Sandy, which I believe happened all the way back in 2012, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, or one of those years. It mm -hmm. had been a number of years. And um, what you noticed when looking throughout these parts of the city was that it was only in communities, um, lower income communities particularly, uh, that uh, have a lot of people of color that were not really taken care of in the way that um, the wealthier parts of the cities were taken care of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see some reflections of that now in 2021, uh, as we're still dealing with the pandemic, you see that in the way of homelessness um, in the city and, you know, realizing to the people that live, for example, on the Upper West Side, which is a pretty affluent part of New York City, uh, that homelessness is affecting all parts of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and this isn't something that people can escape. You can't just close your, your windows and act like they're not there because as soon as you take a walk to the grocery store, you know, you, you are passing people um, of all different backgrounds, all different looks and, and ages that are now finding them, uh, themselves in these places of um, without a home and without food. And, and it's a horrible situation. So... I feel like the Dream Unfinished mission is always to give a voice to the voices that haven't been able to speak um, or that haven't been been given the spotlight to speak. So the way that we did this, um, as you sort of mentioned, was through programming composers that had particularly um, some connections to these communities. Um, so one of these composers was a person that uh, that that grew up in the Rockaways, for example, in um, way out in, in the far ends of Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and he grew up in this community, though he no longer lives in that community. Um, he's still, you know, a wonderful um, composer and, and, and tends to, in his writing, speak a lot to the community that he grew up in. Um, mm. So, you know, we, compo we, we programmed composers that had direct connections to some of these neighborhoods, but we also um, programmed some composers that hadn't necessarily had direct connections, but that had, um, had written pieces that were very much in, I would say, in relation to the topic that we were covering. Mm -hmm. So um, there was one piece called Undercurrent uh, that, that is sort of invoking this, this uh, feeling that, you know, there's always something uncertain um, in our society. Uh, and this was by Laura Kaminsky, by the way, hmm. um, who is a wonderful composer. And, and we had the opportunity to work directly with her on this particular project. So she also became sort of an advocate during that season and did some presentations along with us. Hmm. Um, and so I think in, in, in a lot of these situations, there are pieces that, um, that had a very direct connection to the community in which they serve. Mm -hmm. At the same time, most of the pieces are newer works. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity to allow for some potential commissioning projects, which we've done in the past with, with, uh, with composers. 
um, as well as composers that just haven't been given the the same recognition as some of perhaps their white counterparts if we're programming more composers of color um, and to just really give them an honest platform um, to speak you know through music mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you you know you bring that up and it and it sort of leads to one of my um, other questions which is about your your uh, project uh, which was a solo performance tour, so a little bit different, I guess, than from this kind of collaborative Dream Unfinished. But um, your Bach to Black notes, um, and you're pairing music by Johann Sebastian Bach, but with music by these neglected composers of color, and uh, addressing, you know, oppression and inequality. So it seems like there's a little bit of a thread um, that ties to that as well. Could you give some examples of what those programs are like and the concept and the connection that gave it shape? Absolutely. So, you know, around the same time that uh, the Dream Unfinished was coming into fruition, I was thinking on a soloistic standpoint, you know, what is it that I truly believe in, in terms of uh, music and programming, music that, that, that speaks very near and dear to me. Earlier on, I talked about some of the music that I had originally fallen in love with, um, which is sort of more traditional piano classical music that you'll find, you know, most Mm -hmm. trained classical pianists um, playing. The Chopin ballades and etudes, the Bach, Welter, Clavier and partitas and English suites and French suites. And I mean, all of these wonderful works. Mm -hmm. Um, And I find it really hard to not program some of those works. Um, when I'm building a program. And so I, I personally, I love Bach. And I mean, every day I try to play Bach if, if I can. Um, so I wanted to keep Bach as sort of the, um, the starting point on these programs. And so I called this Bach to Black Notes. And what it essentially is, is I, I start a program with, uh, with a piece of Bach. Um, so let's say that it's a partita. Um, and then I juxtapose it with another composer um, who I think whose music speaks to society just as much as, um, say, a Bach partita does, but perhaps that people haven't been exposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the past, there have been composers such as Margaret Bonds that I've programmed um, next to J.S. Bach. Um, Mm -hmm. and other composers such as Frederick Zewski, um, composers that particularly speak uh, through music to social justice issues. So, you know, Frederick Zewski is a composer that almost all of his output is about some sort of social justice issue. Um, One of his large works is called The People United Will Never Be Defeated. Mm -hmm. Um, But some of his smaller works are also um, written off of, say, protest music. For example, there's uh, four North American ballads, which uh, one of the pieces is called Down by the Riverside. And it was for a while one of my favorite pieces to program because it takes this wonderful tune that many people know, Down by the Riverside, mm-hmm. and it stylizes it in the uh, fabric of what we hear in newer music today. So you might hear snippets of this theme um, put in, in, in the right hand while a, a snippet of, of another section of the piece is being played in the left hand. Oh. Um, and I feel like this is a good sort of commentary on our society mm-hmm. and how many things are actively happening today with technology right. in the world. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's, that's a very direct reflection to how music has changed over the course of time. Oh. So I, I like to program particularly newer composers, um, but composers that speak of injustice and uh, not only that speak of injustice, but composers that have been part of injustice throughout society. So yeah. even if they aren't living anymore, like Margaret Bonds and Florence Price and Savalier de St. George, these are composers whose music, I think, has stood the test of time. Mm-hmm. And uh, that deserves to be heard. So I've programmed many of these programs to have predominantly music by composers of color. Um, but they're not all of that way. Sometimes it's music uh, that that forms a different story through the way that the music is is crafted on the program. It just sort of depends. But I call all of these programs Bach to Black Notes because they all start with Bach, and it sort of takes us down a trajectory, um, something a little different in every program. Yeah, yeah. 
I can't let that pass either. You say you personally love Bach, and that Bach does seem to be a touchstone for many, many musicians, and not just classical musicians either. And, you know, you, you, you sort of, you've got the Pablo Casals vibe going here where you're trying to play Bach every day. Could you, could you talk a little bit about what is special about Bach to you? What, why do you love Bach? Well, Bach to me is very complex yet simple. So one of the things that I'm talking about with my students all the time as a, as a piano teacher in particular is voicing. And this is something that um, pianists almost uniquely worry about, um, you know, versus other instruments. Of course, organ also has multiple voices that play at a time. But I feel like with piano, we have sort of a, um, a, a, another form of expression through dynamic touch in a way that perhaps organists don't. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that makes the, the possibilities endless mm -hmm. when it comes to Bach. Which voice do you bring out? Um, and how do those voices communicate and have a dialogue back and forth with each other? Mm -hmm. And this means that there's never a dull moment in Bach, even for something that's very slow, like a saraband. There's mm -hmm. never a dull moment. It's always singing from one note to the next. And I think there's also this historical element of the fact that Bach did not write these pieces for the piano, um, but many of them he wrote for the harpsichord or the clavichord, which had some slightly different mechanisms regarding how the sound is actually generated. So it helps to inform the way that we could think about the work, but it also gives us many possibilities with to execute it. Mm. So the use of pedaling and how, how we choose to use the pedal, if we choose to use the pedal. These are things that could change drastically from one performance to another. And in, uh, in my belief, I don't believe that it really gives one performer precedent uh, into the sort of genuine way of playing Bach as anybody else. Mm. Um, that it, it becomes a very personal sort of a thing um, between you and Bach, and then when you've sort of crafted something that you truly believe in um, with the piece, then that, that means that you now can share that with the audience. And I feel like Bach is a composer that, that just feels very, um, it feels very accessible to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And playing on a different instrument would have been completely normal in the Baroque era, right? You play with the instruments that are available to you. Um, they didn't have pianos, so therefore they didn't play on pianos, but now we have pianos. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and another thing to note about that time was that people were big improvis uh, improvisers mm -hmm. during that time. And, you know, you mentioned um, sort of my musical upbringing, though I didn't come from a very musical family. Um, as I mentioned, I did have a lot of musical influences around me, and one of those influences came from a church that I was brought up in. And um, in, in this particular church, there were um, lots of musicians and, and oftentimes we would just get together and play music together into the night. Um, and it was, you know, a plethora of different types of instruments. We had guitar and mandolin and banjo and saxophone oh. and, of course, piano and organ. And it was just a conglomerate of sort of random instruments, flute. I remember somebody would bring in the flute and the violin and people would just sort of make things up. Mm -hmm. um, we'd usually base it off of, of, of a song that everybody knew, but... Uh, you know, we'd pass it around to different people to take the solo and, and it and it kind of created a almost a jazz kind of atmosphere where there is this freedom to communicate just through the music with another person. And so that's something that's been really a part of me since a pretty young age. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Bach has really he's really the one that allows for some of that improvisation to um to shine in a way that yeah. If you were to try some of the, those things with other composers, uh, say Beethoven or Schumann, <laughs> you know, there might be a little bit more criticism around the corner if you decide to just, you know, neglect a marking that Schumann so specifically wrote, for example, yeah, which, of yeah. course, he did write with so many um, particular markings. And Bach did, too. But there are a lot of things that we don't find so much in Bach's music, for example, dynamic markings and mm -hmm. pedal markings. Um, and even fingering choices, you know, lots of things, lots of possibilities within Bach's keyboard music. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I swear you are either reading my mind or you hacked into my computer and looked at some of my questions because the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was improvisation. (laughs) Mm. Um, Because, you know, improvisation is something that classically trained musicians often don't get much, if any, experience in in doing. And so you've sort of explained now what your connection is to that. And I want to specifically put it in the context of that sanctuary, sanctuary project, NYC, which you are describing as involving structured improvisation. Could you talk a little bit about Sanctuary Project NYC and, and kind of how that works? Sanctuary NYC is a group of musicians and dancers. And basically we got together, it was almost, a, it was a spinoff sort of from another group. We tried this idea where we were pairing music that was already written. We would pair works by Debussy and even a couple works by Bach and 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 uh, the dancers would choreograph works to these pieces and we would put on different performances and it worked for a while but um, I felt as a musician that I I was sort of um, I wasn't able to be as free or as creative as I really wanted to be it felt like the the dancers got that freedom Mm -hmm. and the musicians kind of had to stick to the script Uh, so sanctuary is is a way that it's it can really organically come together so basically we kind of put ourselves we lock ourselves in this room of course this is pre-pandemic times yeah. and uh we have an idea maybe somebody has a story about that for example one of the stories was about one of the dancers grandmother uh, grandmother she had this um this like vision during mm-hmm. this surgery that she had and this whole work was about crafting the vision into a musical and a dance work. Hmm. Um, so we thought about like what sort of instrumentation would this would this feel like? Um, of course, it feels sort of uh, tribal in a sense. She's having this this vision of God in her in her sense. And mm-hmm. so um, you know, we thought about very percussive elements. Um, and in fact, for for some of this particular performance, which we sort of we crafted this improvisation over time into a performance where everything had a particular um, length, you know, I, I could I could do whatever I wanted, but I had to keep it like 30 seconds or something like that. We would kind of craft a structure throughout it. So that's what I mean when I say structured, structured improv. Um, but within that 30 seconds, I might, uh, instead of playing predominantly the piano, I might um, knock on the fallboard of the piano or something like that. Um, or I might reach inside the piano and I might sort of do something uh, like, I don't know if you can hear this, but kind of on the strings, I might do something like like that sort of a sound ah. instead. And, and so, sort of get some interesting effects out of the piano that... Um, that perhaps help relay whatever message that in this case uh, we're trying to convey, which is um, this vision that the grandmother is having and Mm -hmm. how she um, felt sort of connected to God in her dream that she had Mm -hmm. uh, or in her vision that she had. So, you know, this was one example out of many different uh, things that we've done so far as a group. But every time that we meet, it's something completely new. Um, it's also helped explore the idea of composition for many musicians, uh, myself included, that don't really consider ourselves to be composers. But when you have to um, communicate your your idea about whether what other instruments, and the dancers in this case, um, can add to the product, you have to find ways of communicating that, which means you either write it down in very traditional sheet music form or you write it down in some other way. But, you know, you have to be able to communicate your structure. And I put that in quotes, the structure of the improvisation to the other musicians and dancers, too. So Mm -hmm. it's been a really fulfilling project so far. And um, because of the pandemic, of course, we've been kind of on on hold. But Mm -hmm. I'm sure post pandemic for groups like this and for many others, um, there's going to be a, a lot of interesting artwork coming out of 2020 and 2021. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So in addition to all of your performing, you are also a teacher. And 
I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what you love about teaching and also how you are staying engaged with your students in this time, you know, how they're getting along and, and uh, you know, how an outlet this is for them and for you in these times. You know, how's that going? Well, I have to say that for me, teaching during the pandemic has been wonderful. Um, first of all, to stay connected to all of my students, um, or at least very many of them. And in fact, some newer ones um, hmm. that live far, far away that I've never actually met in person. But um, but it's been a, a wonderful sense of community to still have music making happening literally every day of the week. Um, I have a student and... Um, you know, even pre-pandemic, it was something, it was it was that sort of stability in in my life, in my musical life, you mm -hmm. know, with in the midst of, of traveling and, and always preparing um, for different types of concerts uh, in different types of formats and whatnot. But you always come back to the practice room, which luckily I can can join a student in the practice room. And, um, you know, as, as I was sort of talking about earlier, one of my biggest influences came when I was surrounded by people that were better than me, other students that were better than me when I was um, in my teenage years. And I, I try to provide that for my students without being discouraging. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, whether it's me playing something for them or me showing them a recording of something or, or of somebody um, playing a piece that they're working on, um, I, I find that when working with somebody online, uh, in particular, I can really see the sparks go off in their face or no sparks go off at <laughs> all. You know, I can see the immediately immediate reaction. For example, if I'm showing them a, a new piece, uh, that I think would be a fun piece for them to work on. Mm -hmm. Um, and many of my students right now are in, um, sort of sets of pieces, which has been really fun to be working on during the pandemic. So as opposed to uh, giving them this piece and that piece from all these different composers and, and time periods, we've been able to really just stick in something. So I have a couple of my teenage students right now playing some Prelude and Fugue from the Well-Tempered Clavier, and they've been doing really wonderful at it. And it's been great to explore more than just one Prelude and Fugue, but to explore this whole, um, or at least one of the two full volumes of, of the Walter Bocabier um, mm. with them. Uh, a couple of my younger students are working through uh, some pieces by Bergmuller, who is uh, not really too well known of a composer outside of, uh, let's say, the music classroom. But, um, but I mean, all of his pieces are so versatile in terms of the characters. And so it really, it really helps to make that transition for a student between this is how you read the notes on the page. Mm -hmm. And this is how you actually communicate an idea and a message through the notes on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always very fun to find pieces like that, that, that fit. Um, particularly with younger students, mm -hmm. and to you know help them realize that all of this work that they're doing is 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 just another form of communication um, yeah. at its core. And yes, the notes get more complicated, but that just allows for our toolbox to get more tools in it, so that we have the uh, ability when we want to improvise to really um, show off kind of what we have in mind for real and not just what we can do, but what we want to do. Yeah. So that's been very fun. And through the pandemic, I guess there've been a number of technological challenges for music teachers. Um, but I think for me, it's been a, a challenge that's very welcomed. So um, right now I, I have uh, in my piano studio, a number of cameras and microphones and lights and monitors set up, um, which actually works very well because it feels like me in my own house here, I'm able to see my student and they're right next to me. Mm -hmm. And I have different cameras set up so they can see me right next to them as if I'm sitting in the same room at my piano and they're at their piano. Um, though I can also show them the view above my hand, especially for little students, the ones that are just starting out and need to know where their C five finger scale is and things like that. <laughs> um, so that's very useful. And then I can share my, uh, my music and their music mm -hmm. with them, with markings and all on my iPad. Um, so in a, in a way, technology 
has allowed for us to move a little bit faster when when it comes to music learning, at least in a basic sense. Mm. And in uh, and, and sort of a more advanced level, I'd say it's allowed for people to um, have to really find their way a little bit more regarding mm. practicing independently and, you know, making their piano at home, whatever, however good or not good that piano is, but making it sound wonderful. That's been a, a big challenge that people have had. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I never realized before some of the instruments that my students were practicing on at home uh -huh. and the way that they were sitting at those instruments. And so now I see some of my most advanced students um, have been getting by by playing on such small keyboards and things. And I'm like, oh, no, we have to find a way to get you a larger piano here because you're totally capable of playing, you know, on a much larger instrument. And then meanwhile, I have some of my very little tiny students which are um which are fortunate enough to have really nice grand pianos but they they don't know how to sit at them so <laughs> you know we have to work through these small details um just like we would in person but you know now that i can see the pianos that they're working on i can really cater directly for each and every student so the pandemic has been better for me in that way in terms of teaching wow that's that's really amazing. I mean, those are things you never would know otherwise, right? I, I think that's, that's, I had a blind spot in my mind about that, but that is brilliant because, yeah, that is a really important thing, the instrument that these children have. Um, uh, that's right. It's I, really funny, some yeah. of the setups that you see sometimes yeah. they have. I mean, yesterday I had a little student who was playing on a high chair <laughs> he, and, and they have the table put up on the kitchen table uh, or they have that piano put on the kitchen table and uh, he was sitting at his high chair and i'm like i guess that's your only solution you guys are doing the best you can <laughs> oh man but, oh, um, man. and they, they told me at the end of that lesson that they're looking on upgrading now and, wow. and getting a full-size keyboard with wow. a with a chair and everything wow. so. well this is what Stephanie. happens when you start children at age three playing the piano that's they're right still and in the high how, chair how, that's right you don't know when they're gonna <laughs> progress or how much they're going to progress or how much they're going to like it and yeah by yeah by the time they're four or five you know yeah it's time for them to upgrade yeah yeah definitely definitely well i have uh, been speaking with pianist kyle p walker via zoom i this has been delightful thank you so much for making time and and all the best well, thank you so much for having me, and uh, all the best to you as well. 